So does that worry you at all? Does that, does that, what's your take on, on the central bank digital currency future that I'll speak at least from a U.S. centric view, the Biden administration, that's their, you know, it's been, it's, it's clear as day. If you look at the uh, presidential quarter, uh, presidential quarterly economic report, they dedicated 20 pages and the first it, the first uh, paragraph of those 20 pages basically was making the case as to why central banks are necessary, mm-hmm. why you need a state for uh, a currency, and why central bank digital currencies are a good thing. So what does this fight look like to you? It, it, it is, is you know, the theory of the sovereign individual going to come true where Bitcoiners are just going to flee? They're just going to leave, perhaps leave the states, maybe go to countries like El Salvador. Uh, does this, is this something that you think about as a Bitcoiner? Yes, think about it a lot. And um, what many people call clown world and what many people mistakenly call late stage capitalism, I think is in truth late stage central banking. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Today's very special guest, been looking forward to this conversation for a while now, Robert Breedlove. Been thinking about the first question to ask you for a while now, and I think the most appropriate for you, Robert, is after the years that you've been doing this, um, you know, after the famous Sailor series that, you know, people received extremely well, I'm going to ask you, what is money? <laughs> I'd be lying if I didn't say I saw that question coming. Um, I This is such a weird <clears throat> question, actually. And one of the, the latest things that I've learned, and this is, we released an episode recently that was titled The Most Important Question in the World. And what it was, was essentially a composite of prior guests on the What Is Money show answering the question, what is money? And my editor did a great job of slicing these together. And um, one of my takeaways from that particular episode, uh, we've done, we did, we released one of these, we released a second one. I think we've got two or three more in in the backlog. So we have like, 
four to five hours that we've accumulated of guests answering that question, what is money over our 300 some odd episodes that we've released now. So it's been very interesting, but my takeaway from that particular composite episode was that it seemed to be asking the question, what is money seemed to be a kind of a psychological mirror perhaps. And that the way that guests answer the question is somewhat telling of their own character. Uh, now this is a hypothesis. I'm not saying that this is a conclusive fact. It's just an observation I made after we released it. And I listened to that episode. Um, and, a, a for instance would be like, you know, if you listen to the sailor series, um, he'll describe money as the highest energy that humans can channel. Or, uh, I think he also calls it something like an amalgam of all the powers that humans can possibly harness, right? So you can use money, for instance, to acquire or channel kinetic energy, chemical energy, gravitational energy, thermal energy, et cetera, et cetera. Money's like this meta structure that lets you um, tap into really anything that humans are, are capable of harnessing. And um, so his answer to that question, it kind of tells you something about Sailor's, perhaps tells you something about Sailor's actual psychology and that, well, he's a, he's a powerful guy. He's an effective entrepreneur. He's a, he's a historian, right? He's thought deeply about these topics for clearly many years. He's very widely read um, and he's, you know, focused a lot of his reading on like ancient Roman history and uh, other very successful entrepreneurs like Carnegie and, um, you know, the oil tycoons, steel tycoons, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like his perspective on money, not only is it is it telling about kind of the nature and structure and ontology of money itself, but it's also revealing something about the actual individual answering the question too. And then if you go forward one series to, to the Booth series, um, you know, Jeff Booth will give you this very academic description of how money works and how it flows between people. But then he also takes a step back and says something like, to the effect of money doesn't really matter. You know, it's more about love and relationships and belonging. And so that seems to be kind of telling about how, how he individually chooses to lead his life. And, um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not maybe answering your question, what is money per se, but it's just the thing I've been thinking about recently is that it asking that particular question had this very unexpected result that just occurred to me. Like I said, when we released this thing a couple of weeks ago, that it seems to be serving as a psychological mirror of sorts that, uh, that in which you see the the subtle or perhaps deeper character of the individual answering the question reflected. And, um, that's been, I don't know, like it was just, it just caught me off guard. So like every time I think I feel so fortunate to have launched this show and then now the whole world, you know, you got Brie Dalio on national TV saying that the defining question is what is money? And then you've got Elon Musk, uh, making these big appearances saying, you know, what is money? It's like, it seems to be like, it's, quickly becoming the defining question of our era and maybe in 50 years time or something like that we'll look back on it as such um so i feel very fortunate to have kind of struck gold digital goals perhaps um or or posed a question that's very concordant with the current zeitgeist I already had that gratitude and appreciation in place, but now again, watching that composite episode, it, like it blew my mind again. I was like, Oh my goodness. Wow. You're actually seeing something else about there's a conversation beneath the conversation, right? There's a, there's a response beneath the response to the question. And I, I found that to be fascinating. And, um, again, I call it a psychological mirror. I don't know. This is like a, a term that I've put to this thing that I'm trying to describe. But it's interesting to me, again, that it's most of the answers we have for money tend to have this reflective property. You know, that it, 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 you know, 
money is not wealth, but it reflects wealth. Um, prices are, is like a prices are a reflection on the consequences of human action in relation to capital. And, um, you know, I think this speaks to the relationship between money and human rationality, that human rationality is this, this self-reflective faculty that we have and money somehow enables or extends that, that we're, we're actually able to extend human rationality into the material domain in a very real way. So, um, yeah, it's just a very, very interesting question. And I'm just grateful to have, have it as the namesake of the show and it keeps yielding more and more insights to me. So, yeah. And it's interesting because I did notice when Elon answered that question about, and, and what was striking to me was his response, which was basically along the lines of there needs to be inflation, right? So you could tell that he hasn't fully taken the orange pill, you know? And then yep. uh, the Ray Dalio clip, I'm very familiar with it as well. But I think what was fascinating to me about what you just said about is the way that you look at money is really a reflection on yourself. And I think mm -hmm. that people really underestimate how vital money is in a society, right? And, you know, it's the, Hoddle not said it best, right? It's, it's half of every transaction in the world, right? And if that base layer is fundamentally corrupted or it's broken, right? Um, I think there are so many downstream effects to that, so many so many consequences to that, that people have no idea what the root cause of are, but I'm going to double back. I'm going to go back to the original question because I'm very curious, Robert, what is money to you specifically as an individual? Oh, it's a great, <laughs> great question. And now that I've made that meta step talking about the psychological mirror, I'm extra cognizant of my answer, <laughs> but I, you know, when I originally, this is before launching the podcast, I'd always thought about money as time, you know, and this is something that I, I incorporated into masters and slaves of money in particular that was looking, I think the opening line in that piece is like money is a tool for trading human time. So an ingredient to basically everything of value in the global economy is human time. You could also call it human effort or human energy or human attention perhaps, but uh, the common denominator that I always focus on was just time itself. And I, I guess the reason I did that was because even in the term, like the term economize, right? It means to, to accomplish the same or greater result with less effort, the same or less effort, right? You're actually increasing output per unit of input. And so what we're doing when we trade with one another is allowing each of us to specialize in a very fine uh, stage of a production process and then interlink ourselves together through trade such that the thing that we ultimately make is something that none of us could ever make individually. You know, we get these incredible innovations and uh, there's a great essay on this titled I Pencil. If you've never read it, it's beautifully poetic, describing essentially how no one, no one, no individual on earth can construct a pencil, that it, it is this emergent good from, you know, the wood is from this continent, the lead is from that continent, the metal is from here. And it, it takes all of these people engaged in a collaborative effort to create something as simple as a pencil. Um, and so... I, I am, I still, you know, Sailor blew my mind when we started talking about money as energy because it was just like, it was like, oh, of course it's energy. I'd never thought about it that way. But my original um, view on it had always been that it's, it's more time than energy. But ultimately, I guess the deeper I've gotten down this rabbit hole, the one thing I keep coming to is the insufficiency or inadequacy of language itself. Um, there is that, I had, um, this guy shared a quote from Ray Kurzweil on the show, 
who said that language is a very thin pipe through which to describe something as complex as consciousness. And I feel that really landed with me. Um, it, we're all human beings. We're all living in this complex, fluid, uh, fully interconnected reality, right? It's a continuum, right? The world continuum that everything affects everything else. Everything touches everything else, either directly or indirectly. Um, it's all energy, it's all liquid, something like that. And language, with language, we're, we're slicing it and dicing it, right, into little discrete data packets such that we can talk about it, we can think about it, we can reflect upon it. And um, I think maybe that question, what is money, is like, it's, pointing at that right it's like if we we call money this we call money the language of value so clearly it's a very it's linguistic sort of in its nature and that it, it allows us to communicate about you know the consequences of human action um one way I've, I've thought of framing this that was useful for me was if words are the media of exchange of human conception then money is the media of exchange of human action whereas like maybe even your five senses are the media of exchange of human perception right we're actually perceiving the world with our five senses we then convert that and wrap it into these little discrete data packets called words to develop conceptions from that um and somewhere between there, perception and conception, we get this emergent socioeconomic phenomenon called money. That's the medium of exchange of human action, right? So it's actually, it's it's a very high signal communication device. Um, and somehow supersedes language or is very hard to describe, obviously, which again can, explains why so many people have so many different answers. Um, and perhaps also explains why it is, it functions as a psychological mirror because if it, if it is that complex, it's like it can be answered in a lot of different ways. And when you attempt to answer it, it's kind of like in quantum physics, right? Where the observer participates with the observation. If you've ever heard of the eyes, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the act of observation actually changes the thing that you're observing so that you can never know simultaneously the exact position and trajectory of a particle you can know one or the other but you can't know both with uh it, it's like it's a again it's a continuum right the more you know the trajectory the less you know the position and vice versa so something about what is money it's like what is the word what is language and obviously that's a very deep question too when you look at something like the biblical corpus right the opening <laughs> In the beginning was the word and the word was god and the word was with god like it's there's something very essential about this intermediate this intermediation um this intermediating function i guess you would say that both language and money performs and it is exceedingly difficult to describe uh but also exceedingly important so I, again, I'm not sure if I answered your question at all there, you, you but totally, you totally, you totally, swimming around. <laughs> you totally did. And you said, put a tremendous amount of signal in there. And the two concepts, right, to you specifically as an individual, money is time. Um, I'm in that camp as well. Um, to Sailor, money is energy, right? Uh -huh. um, and then the last bit that you said, which I think is really interesting, um, is the fact that and I think you nailed this and perhaps you, 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 you said it on a subconscious level, which is, I think human beings, I think the necessity of having a type of uh, using money is necessary to the human experience. I think, and if you look at history, right, even if you go back to the very, very, you know, prehistoric era there was still bartering there was still trade and there there was still a form of money and i think that you couldn't get away from that and i think that really since the advent of the internet 
uh, really since, you know, if you believe uh, the theory from the sovereign individual, um, the rise of information technologies, you know, uh, CPUs, right, that made all the, made Bitcoin itself possible. And now we are moving into the next iteration of what money is and what it could be. But before I go down that rabbit hole, what I, I want to ask you, Robert, because I know that you've spent a tremendous amount of time focusing on this on your show, is what happens when the money's broken, right? And, you know, Bitcoiners make a meme of it and they say time theft. Mm-hmm. What happens when the money is broken? What, what are the consequences of broken money to a society? Yeah, you know, another frame that's useful for comparing such disparate things as an individual and an economy, right? That the individual is much more concrete, right? Where we know we we have a lot of lived experience with the individual. An economy is something much more abstract, right? We engage in it and we participate in it, but you don't see an economy, right, in any concrete sense. But what they both are in a in a modern secular parlance is that they're both complex adaptive systems. So what are they doing? They're, you know, both the individual and the economy, they're trying to model the world. They're trying to uh, adapt to it, right? To, to overcome obstacles and problems and, and whatnot. And uh, a key process to that end is communication, right? Like, for instance, if you are if you're a human trying to adapt to your environment, well, it's pretty important that you have eyesight and good hearing. You know, if you're if you're in the middle of the savanna or the jungle and you're blind, right? You know, you're you're going to get nature's natural selection is going to have its way with you. So your communication systems as an in individual complex adaptive system, if they're not functioning well. Any of your five senses, but obviously something like eyesight would be more important than maybe taste. Um, that's going to, although taste can also be important, right? To, to taste if something's poisonous or not. Um, that's going to inhibit you. That's going to inhibit your survival ability. And so when we look at the complex adaptive system of an economy, when you start screwing with the money, right? That is the communicate, that is the nervous system of the economic organism that we're all participating in, that we're all cellular participants in to use a bi biological analogy um when you start screwing with that communications network well then that complex adaptive system loses its ability to perceive the world and model the world and adapt to the world and so it just throws the whole thing into disarray and really jeopardizes its survivability just like the guy in the jungle that's blind right like his inability to, to the the media of exchange of human perception or via his eyes. If that's not working, then he's unlikely to live. Like his his chances of survival plummet. Just like if we screw up the money, right? If we add noise to the communication network of money that's intended to be that in an ideal world, in a Bitcoin world, would just be pure signal, right? All price changes would be reflections of shifts in supplies of capital or demand for for capital or goods um in this in a world where money is being debased and monopolized and corrupted etc those price changes are full of noise you don't know what it is right it's like it could it could be a new policy could be um you know could be currency counterfeiting could be this could be that there's just it's a it's the destruction of the adaptive mechanism, the mechanism by which the global economy adapts to reality is broken when we break the money, just like the mechanism by which the individual adapts to his environment is broken when, when you blind him or, or take away one of his other key senses. So um, I guess you could maybe distill it down to just the throughput of information is that when information is not flowing um 
and this is kind of a weird, I actually think <laughs> information, we use, we use information as if it's a noun, right? Like it's this thing that moves around, but it's really just the pattern of one thing influencing the pattern of another thing. And so I like to think of it more as a verb that, um, the movements of one thing put, uh, uh, the other thing that it's connected to into a new formation. So it's, again, we're back to this continuous fluid reality where uh, everything is connected to everything else. And information is just the, the sequential rearrangement of all these things interacting. Um, when you inhibit that, then you start to accrue misfitness, right? Like the, like the system's not adapting to changes in reality. And so if the system and reality are very close when it's adapting well, well, they start to diverge, right? If the money's broken or you're blind. And and that divergence is a, a representation of risk, essentially. And it, eventually that risk is realized. And um, I think this kind of frames up things like the Austrian business cycle theory, where once you start debasing the currency, you get exacerbated economic booms and bust uh, until one of two things happens, either the currency hyperinflates or they stop printing money and you get this deflationary snap back to reality. Um, and of course, historically, typically it culminates in hyperinflation because the central bank that's debasing the currency has both the profit motive and the precedent um, to do that. So it, it you undermine the adaptive capacity of the species when you screw with the money, just like you undermine the adaptive capacity of an individual when you blind them. Um, so I, I don't, it, it, it takes away the painful. It takes away the correction mechanism, right? Yeah, exactly. The feedback loops are broken. Correct. And then you have these Frankenstein, uh, political ideologies, uh, businesses, um, economic systems that normally would not be viable under a sound money standard that just pop up. Um, and they start to become, I mean, and we're seeing this, we're living through this. Some people call it the fourth turning. If you were, if you were to believe in that theory, but, uh, we're living through this era of what the consequence of broken money, what, what the consequence of living under a broken money system for decades. And I think we're reaching the culmination of that. I think we're living yeah. through it right now. Some people call it the clown world. Yeah. Uh, but you know, from from my perspective, Robert, th th these are these are scary times, and you know, we we, we have a more uh, geopolitically focused show, our, our daily live show. But where where we see it now is really what I see the the battle to come in the next five ten years is really it's going to be. Bitcoin or central bank digital currencies. It, it, it's clear as day that uh, nation states all around the world. This is their this is their future. This is what they believe the future of money is, right? Or central bank digital currencies. And and to kind of tie it into what you were saying about removing that correction mechanism, I feel like central bank digital currencies is just it's gonna throw it's gonna it's gonna throw gasoline on that, right? It's gonna make it a hundred times worse. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high res three inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code Bitcoin23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. 
Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian Chris Rock. This is insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. That's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> like, I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a coin join. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make coin joins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. So does that worry you at all? Does that does that What's your take on on the central bank digital currency future that I'll speak at least from a U.S. centric view, the Biden administration, that's their, you know, it's been it's it's clear as day. If you look at the uh, presidential quarter, uh, presidential quarterly economic report, they dedicated 20 pages and the first the first uh, paragraph of those 20 pages basically was making the case as to why central banks are necessary. Mm -hmm. why you need a state for uh, a currency and why central bank digital currencies are a good thing. So what does this fight look like to you? It, it, it is, is, you know, the theory of the sovereign individual going to come true where Bitcoiners are just going to flee. They're just going to leave, perhaps leave the States, maybe go to countries like El Salvador. Uh, does this, is this something that you think about as a Bitcoiner? Yes, think about it a lot. And um, what many people call clown world and what many people mistakenly call late stage capitalism, I think is in truth late stage central banking. Um, it's not surprising whatsoever that we have progressed from a country, like again, US centric. Um, perspective here, a country which respected life, liberty, and property, and we had a tremendous amount of economic success, but once we had the implementation of the Federal Reserve in 1913, uh, the trajectory has started to change, right? We've become steadily less free over time, right? This is the land of the free and the home of the brave, as the national anthem says, but once you put that institution that anti-capitalistic, anti-human freedom institution at the heart of the U.S. economy, it starts to regress. And, you know, if we look at communism, communism being the abolition of private property, right? That's what Marx, that was the whole idea. From each according to their ability to each according to their need, there are no property owners. The state owns everything, doles it out arbitrarily, uh, I, you know, in this in a way that is beneficial for people right according to their need as he said we've seen that that fails catastrophically in every conceivable way we also have socialism which is the institutionalized policy of aggression against private property so not the abolition right if, if communism is at this extreme end of no private property whatsoever um, socialism is kind of the spectrum between where you're you're aggressing against it more or less depending on how how severely you're taxing the population or how rapidly you're debasing the currency uh, both of which function as the theft of purchasing power you're stealing from uh, you're violating the property of productive market actors or stealing from them 
And then at the opposite end of the spectrum from communism is, is capitalism in a true sense, which is the institutionalized policy of respect for private property and in contractual agreement between property owners. Um, it's not surprising to me at all that when you install a central bank which derives all of its revenues you know, from seniorage or expansion of the money supply, it sells the new currency units at uh, a market rate that they produce at a below market rate, uh, that that uh, delta being their, their profit, um, that's theft, right? You're, you're now violating the private property of savers, people that are depending on the currency um, as a mode of savings are now having their property rights violated by the central bank. And it's a very slippery slope, right? Once you start printing the money, you've, you now increase the misallocation of capital such that the, the net, the next bust is even more painful. There's more liabilities in the system that default. So the next round of monetary printing, according to the Keynesian philosophy is you have to print money to cover all of that. So it's exponentially more debasement of currency and theft of purchasing power from productive market actors, which is an exponential increase in the violation of private property. So you start moving along that spectrum, right? You're moving away from capitalism further into socialism and that private property is being aggressed against more rapidly, more aggressively, more assiduously, whatever you want to say. And the end game right? The end game of that aggression against private property is the abolition of private property. So we, it's no surprise to me whatsoever that the world is moving along the spectrum away from capitalism and toward communism in, in lockstep with how rapidly we debase the currency, uh, or currency supplies around the world. Um, I don't know. It, it's it's painfully obvious if you study money and you study the history of states and where they end up, but people just don't understand this, right? These these isms are thrown around. Again, back to the insufficiency of language. Like, there's not a consensus on what communism is or what socialism is or what capitalism is, and hiding beneath all of that ignorance is this this like sad degeneration of the world and it, it's very self-defeating you know even even the shareholders of central banks that benefit from this scheme they're undermining the market process itself in the long run so all of the wealth that they accumulate comes at the the expense of restricting the potential of wealth creation in the broader market and the potential for innovation the potential for human flourishing so um i'm reminded here of the way Rothbard put it, and I basically paraphrase, he said that, you know, the state is a robber baron that will just plunder its victims until there's nothing left to plunder. And then once once it's plundered everything there is to plunder, it just dies, right? It's killed its own food source. Um, it's like a parasite that kills the host. So, um, yeah, I, it, it's, it's kind of a an unfortunate state of affairs, but you know, thank God for Bitcoin because I don't know what we would do in the face of this rising tide of global communism if it were not for Bitcoin. Yeah, and 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 you know, and I'm really glad that that uh, that you brought that up, and it's something that I've I've spent a lot of time thinking about, right? Which is unless you do something kinetic, like a kinetic, like, you know, revolution. So bringing up, you know, call to arms. Bitcoin really defunds this completely. Um, it, it really stops it in its tracks. Um, and I, I would even go on to say that there's certain political ideologies that would not be possible under a, a Bitcoin standard if you remove the wealth redistribution mechanism, putting taxation aside, but the wealth redistribution mechanism of inflation, and if you take that away, um, can't really buy your voters, so to speak. Can't really be offering these things because the only way to offer these things is through 
raising taxes via direct taxation, uh, via direct taxation, meaning you become very po- unpopular with your constituents, right? But if you remove that element altogether, right, and you go on a Bitcoin standard, then I would say that there's a lot of very popular political ideologies without getting into any specifics that would not be economically, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be viable. They, they, they would just disappear. And then what I just said leads me to the next thing is I suspect they're going to fight tooth, they're going to fight Bitcoin tooth and nail because it's a matter of survival. It's, it's a matter of, it's their system, right? Or it's Bitcoin, right? And I and I and Robert, I think we're already seeing this. We're already seeing this fight back, right? And and of course, it's under the guise of of many things, right? You know, the moral virtue, yeah. you know. Um, but does that worry you at all, or are you from the are you coming from the camp of the better flag theory of you know Bitcoin's just Bitcoin's like water; it's just going to go flow to where it's treated best, and Bitcoiners are going to follow suit. Um, or do, or it gets to a point where do we have to stand our ground, right? Where it's like, look, you know, um, we at least have to fight, you know, we at least have to fight so that America doesn't go down that path because if America does go down that path and it sure does look like it is going down that path, it is going to make the, the lives of Bitcoiners, the people, the individuals that are choosing to opt out of that said system, it can make their lives a living hell. Or is this the inevitable collapse of an empire like we've seen throughout history? Well, <laughs> I guess the beautiful thing about Bitcoin, even when we use that metaphor, right? Stand our ground. It's a it's a battle metaphor, right? Someone's attacking you and rather than retreating, you stand your ground and fight. But what we're talking about with Bitcoin is just a, it's a radically new incentive system, right? Where you you have the option that you don't, you don't need to stand your ground. Actually, you can move and take all your wealth with you to whatever ground um, is most favorable to, to you, right? Whatever political conditions, geographic conditions, et cetera, are most favorable to you. And on the point of, I, you know, political ideologies dwindling in the wake of a Bitcoin standard or, or Bitcoin monetizing, I think it's absolutely true because, you know, if you put all of these things under the rubric of statism, whether it's fascism, communism, even U.S. capitalism, right? It's not true. It's not capitalism would be everyone keeps what they earn, right? There's no taxation. There's no inflation. There's no central bank. That doesn't exist anywhere in the world, even in, even and especially in the U.S., so all of these state isms, you just put them under the umbrella of statism. Well, the political ideologies that are pushed inside of states, as you said, typically with the carrot attached to them of free stuff. Well, when we say free stuff, nothing is actually free, right? Nothing is actually produced in the world for free. What we're actually saying is the state stole some of this stuff from productive people through taxation and inflation. And it's now giving them, providing a rebate back to some of these citizens as an inducement to vote for or support their political candidate or ideology. So in a world, so the thing is like in a world where there is free money or free stuff, that's, you know, quote unquote free stuff, it necessitates and requires an unfree population. There have to be people that are being hemmed in and extracted from, stolen from. There have to be people that are having their property rights violated for free stuff to exist. So in a world, in a Bitcoin world, and that is why this the best quote on this, every public auction is an advanced, I'm sorry, every public election is an advanced auction on stolen goods. So all of these guys that we vote in and support and think that, oh, you know, uh, the Democrat, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. It's like you're, you're, no matter which side you support, they both work um, as statists and they work for central bankers, right? So they're, they're, they're 
advocating for supporting and administering systematic theft. And, you know, I just don't think that it's not something you need to stand and fight. I mean, I don't know, like when I say fight, like there's not, you don't need to stand and have a physical altercation with the state. Um, what you can instead do is use the tools that are at your disposal to move into the places and circumstances where you are treated best. I think that's the best strategy because you're never going to win. You're never going to go toe to toe with the state and win, right? That's just not by definition. The state is the monopoly of power and violence. Like no individual can go on a one-on-one bout with the state and win. But what we can do you know, as, as Hayek said, right, is introduce something by some sly roundabout way that they cannot stop. And I think that thing is Bitcoin. So, and I want to be careful here with my, my thinking and my talking in that it's very easy to say, oh, the state, like it's out there, like it's something external to us. But I really think it is a macrocosm of the individual ego, right? That that little fiction we all have that we are separate and we need to defend ourselves from others and take from others. Maybe we're even justified in our actions to defend our, our own little egoic livelihood. But the truth is, like we said earlier, like everything's connected, right? Everyone, everything affects everything else. It's the world continuum. And just like the ego is that little fictional story we tell ourselves that we're separate from other things to justify certain actions, I think the state is just the macrocosm of that, that we pretend like the United States is somehow separate from China or Russia or India, um, when in reality, they're just these these imaginary constructs that we use to justify coercion and compulsion and violence on human beings. And so there's not, I don't know that you can even I don't know that even Bitcoin can fully eradicate statism, but the key leverage point seems to be making those activities less profitable, just making it, introducing systems or technologies that make coercion, compulsion, and violence less profitable. You make crime, you know that old saying, crime doesn't pay. Well, crime does pay as the existence of the central bank and the nation state proves. Um, but if you, you move as individuals naturally move towards a Bitcoin standard to protect themselves against the predations of central banks and nation states, that makes crime pay less and less and less, right? The, the cost to extract wealth from individuals goes higher and higher and higher. And with that, the businesses that specialize in extracting wealth from individuals decline lower and lower and lower. So I, I, I just want to be careful. Like it's very easy to say, what's the state going to do against us Bitcoiners as if there's some like bright line dichotomy between the state and Bitcoiners when in reality, it's just a mishmash of individuals and that, that amalgam of, you know, this, this complex constellation of individuals acting they're driven primarily by incentive structures, right? It's, it's what is profitable. That's what people are doing. What is profitable. And so the big breakthrough of Bitcoin is just making those activities less profitable, making the violation of private property said differently, making coercion, compulsion, and violence less profitable and therefore less prevalent in the sphere of human affairs. I don't know of any better solution than that. I don't think you can, you know, quote unquote, fight or go toe to toe with the state. You know, maybe, sure, there have been victories in the past, right? Gandhi had peaceful protests about collecting salt down by the shore, which was being taxed by Britain. And, you know, he can like motivate people to pay attention to to certain aspects of, of state criminality and drive social movements and things like this. I'm not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say none of that's valuable or useful, but I don't think we get out of the cycles of criminality associated with statism until we rug pull ourselves on the incentive schema that we're inhabiting. And that's what Bitcoin is, right? It's just money that's, or property more generally, that's really hard to steal or violate. So all the specialists and 
and theft and violation of property, if they don't go out of business, they, um, their businesses shrink uh, to the extent that Bitcoin makes these things less profitable. So I hope that's not too abstract. I'm trying to bring it all down to earth, but um, it, it is such a major change that it's really hard to even conceptualize what the world looks like know. from it, here. It, 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 so, and, and and I really enjoyed your response. It, 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 is this a phenomenon that's going to happen organically? Is this something that bit, just because of Bitcoin's mere incentives alone, the ability for the individual to, you know, store theoretically by memorizing 12 words, uh, millions, billions, or even trillions of dollars that get stored in their minds, mm -hmm. right? And that completely changes the power dynamics, uh, makes it very ineffective for you know, the state to seize wealth on a massive scale. The only reason that they were able to get away with the 6102 order is because most people, if they have a large amounts of gold, they, they custody it in banks, right? But now with the advent of self-custody, the ability, the ability that Bitcoin gives you to do this, if you take personal responsibility, uh, it completely changes those power dynamics. But I guess my question to you is, um, is this phenomenon going to happen organically? Um, is this going to be like the, a slow realization of, you know, of, <laughs> I hate using this word, of the sovereign individuals, the, the, the Bitcoiners that have taken into self-custody, they, they're going to start to, you know, start asking questions and then kind of weigh the pros and cons and say, look, is it really advantageous for me to stay in the United States, even though I work remote and I live in another country? Why am I still paying Uncle, uh, Uncle Sam taxes what is the benefit of having a, a, an American citizenship? You know, and th these are all theories that were, were laid out in, in, in the sovereign individual. So is this an organic process or is this something that's going to require, um, you know, uh, political willpower where people will have to, you know, basically wake up the population? Because the sad reality is, Robert, and this is something that I, it never, never fleed my mind. When Natalie Burnell and Coin Stories asked Michael Saylor what kept him up at night, and his response was, most people don't care about sound money, right? And if that's the case, then it's going to be very easy for the state uh, with their apparatus to uh, herd the cattle, so to speak, into central bank digital currencies. And a lot of people are just going to go willingly because it is convenient to, for them to do so. So... How do you think this plays out? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, you know, which I often say on the show that pain is information, right? Pain is that primary motivational force that encourages people to move into new formations, uh, to reconfigure themselves, to change their circumstances. I don't just mean like physical pain of like your nerves hurting. This could be emotional pain. This could be financial pain. This could be any, any source of uneasiness, right? This, this is like the whole core of, of Austrian economics is that humans act to alleviate felt uneasiness. And although it is much more cost effective to study the world and study um, the history of, of people and how things have changed and how technology changes things, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, apply those lessons to your own life. It's much more cost effective, um, to, to absorb information through learning and education rather than it is learning the proverbial hard way, right? Where you actually have to go through the painful thing yourself. Um, it does seem to me, and again, I'm a, I'm a person that's learned many things the hard way. I think people in general, uh, the majority of people need to learn things the hard way. So yeah, will, will, will states be able to corral people into CBDCs? Perhaps, um, especially if they do it correctly, right? If they don't induce the pain at first and they, they, balance the incentives and the disincentives, you know, perhaps physical cash is steadily expiring over time. And if you switch to the CBDC, you get a little bit of UBI that increases over time or some other type of yield product 
just encouraging people to transition from the familiar, you know, US dollar bank accounts or physical cash into this CBDC product, they could have significant success in, in getting purchasing power to flow and depositors to flow from one system into the other. But I don't think, um, I still think that system is going to be extremely fragile and ultimately collapse because then all you will have done is concentrate more power into fewer hands and open up more people to the exploitation of the few, right? Of, of the, the few people in that benefit as insiders, right? Whether these are shareholders or administrators of central banks or nation states, et cetera. So you're not going to eliminate the infliction of pain. And that is ultimately what will cause people to move. Um, I have no idea what it's going to look like, the actual transition itself. You know, the question is like, is it going to be organic or do people need to take more political action? I don't know. I don't even know exactly where to draw the line between those two terms. You could argue that this whole thing is organic, right? That um, humans organically like to scam one another, right? They not like to, they seek to increase and advance their own individual self-interest, even at the expense of others, if given the opportunity and to the extent that it is profitable to do so. But when other humans create new tools or situations or, or legal structures that make that less, um, that make that more risky or more costly, then humans are, human action is channeled towards, away from non-productive theft towards productive activities as a means of acquiring wealth. So yeah, I, don't know, I guess this is maybe like a long-winded way of saying all roads lead to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how long and painful those roads are. Um, and hopefully the educational effort we're all doing here in the Bitcoin universe is helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, hope we're delivering real orange pills to people that are taking these questions seriously, evaluating uh, themselves as individuals on the stage of history and how how things are changing and hopefully positioning themselves for success in this time of great change and turmoil. Um, and hopefully learning that the real key to all this it's an economic principle, right? That you need to make yourself expensive to tyrannize or difficult this, uh, to be a hard target for the state, right? This is the same thing in nature, right? What, is, what, what animal does the lion eat, right? He eats the weak or the lame or the young, like the, the animal that cannot keep up with the rest of the pack. The lion or the predators will pick off Well the state is the predator in this in the sphere of socioeconomics so if you can be one of those animals that's not uh lagging the pack right and you're you're in the pack or you're ahead of the pack you're 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 vigorous and you're vital then you are more likely to survive the the wealth redistribution schemes that are inevitably coming as the business of statism uh goes into its twilight years um, so yeah, I, it's a weird thing, man. It's, there's, there's going to be pain. People learn through the pain. If you're really smart, you can learn through the pain of others rather than having to learn through the pain yourself. Um, but ultimately I, I just don't see how, so long as Bitcoin continues to exist, it's like people will just have to flow into it as a means of survival. It's a necessity, right? Or maybe today it's like an option or it's a speculation or whatever you want to call it. It depends on where you are in the world. If you're in the comfortable US, especially if you're in the upper class, it's just this speculative investment. If you're in the global south where you've been living under, you know, 20% plus inflation year over year fucking forever, it's a means of survival those conditions that prevail in the global south are coming everywhere right this is again statism right trends away from capitalism 
through that spectrum of socialism, more and more aggression against private property because it's just a business trying to increase its top line and grow like everything else. And it has to culminate in the abolition of private property. And when that happens, like people are destroyed. If you can't, all human rights are destroyed in that situation, right? Ayn Rand said this, property rights are the basis of all human rights. If a man cannot control the product of his labor, there is nothing else. There is no, it's all gone. It's all for naught. Like you forget all human civil liberties, all notions of goodness or compassion or whatever, whatever notions you have about the role of government and the, the affairs of the individual, it's all based on property. And when you abolish that, it's all gone. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three-day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, this is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, just a really all-around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Um, I also agree that we are witnessing the twilight of the nation state model that's been around since the Napoleonic era. I completely agree with you, Robert. Obviously, you know, we are... We are, from an ideological perspective, you know, libertarian, right? Do you, yeah. you know, libertarian, you know, obviously we're, we're capitalism maxis, but, you know, the reality is that a big percentage of the world population, and, and I would even double down and say they're not completely aware of them even supporting this itself. Like if they were truly, um, and it, it reminds me of this very um, famous video on on YouTube by Yuri Bezmenov, which was basically a, Rus a Russian agent that escaped or a Soviet Indian uh, that escaped to the Soviet Union, came to America, and he was talking about the process of demoralization. And I think a large percentage of the population all around the world is demoralized. They've been incepted with this idea that capitalism is the villain. You, you mentioned it earlier on in the, in the podcast when people say we're in late stage uh, capitalism. It's like we haven't even had capitalism. I don't think capitalism is possible with the central bank in the first place. Um, so what about them? What about them? Right. Because the reality is that yeah, I, I truly believe that as you know, the nation state crumbles and, it, and it's in its last death throes, I'm very sure that opportunistic politicians are going to use Bitcoin and Bitcoiners as a scapegoat, as a very successful scapegoat. Say, see your, your problems is to these people and you hear it with the rhetoric. Um, people aren't pay, paying their fair share. You know, you, you hear that rhetoric over and over and over again and it's almost a distraction from what is the root cause? What What is the cause of all their economic woes? The, the cause of all their economic woes is the fact that the money that they're using, right? The base layer, the operating system of which they, in, in which they, in which they perceive the world is fundamentally corrupted. It's broken and it's been stealing from them. And this is a large amount of people. Um, do you believe with, I'm sure you've read this piece by Svetsky, right? Um, you know, the masses don't matter. It's really the remnants. Do you do you believe with that theory? Uh, is it really just as long as we have a, a you know a, a couple 
you know, a handful of Bitcoiners that believe in this, we're just going to go to where we're treated best. But the, the reality is, though, Robert, that we're, we're still going to need the men with guns protecting our property rights in a way, perhaps not in cyberspace, but we all need a we need a we need a physical domain, right? We need a house, right? Um, what what's your take on this? Maybe I, I I've been rambling no, a little no, bit too much myself uh, as well. I am a believer in the the minority rule, which is something Taleb wrote about that the <clears throat> in many systems the preferences of an obstinate minority can impose themselves on a majority and he's given a number of, of examples about this but i think that with bitcoin and typically it's a very small number it's like three to four percent of a population if they have very rigid preferences and the rest of the population is somewhat flexible or or more flexible than the obstinate minority that the, the majority will bend to the preferences of the minority in Bitcoin, I think this is, you have to look at it in terms of capital, right? So whatever Bitcoin's total addressable market is, somewhere between 100 and $400 trillion, perhaps in, in 2023 $20, dollars, maybe higher, I'm not sure. Um, if Bitcoin's market cap gets to, when Bitcoin's market cap gets to 4% of that number, I think that's when things start to get really weird, that the preferences of Bitcoiners start to impose themselves on the world. And and again, if, if the state <clears throat> is, you know, even if states coordinate their efforts and attack on Bitcoin, how are they going to keep that up? Because again, it's like, okay, it all has to be funded through theft. So all the, all they're pushing that pain on all their citizens to fund the gulags and the military and the this and the that and well what are you doing when you do that is you're creating incentives for all those people that are being preyed upon to exit the system right and so it's this it's like a natural selection process that i just don't think you can avoid it's like the harder the state tries to fight back against bitcoin the more pain they create in their citizenry which means they're creating a greater incentive for their citizenry to defect from fiat currency into Bitcoin, which means they're growing the market capitalization of Bitcoin, which means they're reducing reservation demand for fiat currency, which means they have to print more currency even more rapidly and tax the populations even harder to continue the aggression against Bitcoin, which you get into this very vicious feedback loop in which the state collapses and Bitcoin monetizes. I don't know how you prevent that. Like it just, there's no, if, if the state had some productive revenue source, which it doesn't, it's all extractive, then maybe they could fund a, a war against Bitcoin in some meaningful way. But given that all the revenues are, are extractive in nature, I think all of their efforts to, to fight this idea are self-defeating in the end. And that's where, I mean, that's the deep, like, that's where the depth of my conviction comes from. It's like this weird game theoretic incentive structure realignment that no individual can ignore or turn off. Therefore, all the institutional realities we have constructed historically are reconfigured as a result. Yeah. So yeah, they did make some obsolete. Um, and we say this, so we say this all the time on, on simply as well, right? Which is Bitcoin's incentives are stronger than any coercion, yeah. right? And I think that over time, that will become more and more apparent. I want to end it with this, Robert. Um, you are in the you know you are in the media space. You're one of the most successful Bitcoin uh, you know uh, podcasters uh, to date. Um, one of the most popular. Um, one of the things that what I'm seeing right is the attempt of breaking through the Bitcoin echo chamber. Because the reality is that a lot of the content that we make, right, whether the top of the funnel, mid funnel, you know, whatever, wherever, which way, wherever you are in that funnel of, of Bitcoin content creator, wherever you fall, the reality is that the vast majority of people that watch our content, Robert, are already yeah. Bitcoiners, right? So how do we break that echo chamber? How, is that something that you've put thought into? How do we get the ideas of Bitcoin, the ethos of Bitcoin, into the mainstream consciousness so that we can avoid this inevitable clash 
with the state that I think is coming. The, the, the looming clouds are moving closer ever so slowly. Um, is that something that you've, you've put some thought into? Yeah, it is. I mean, even the origin story of the show, I, I didn't name it Bitcoin anything. You know, the, the show doesn't have Bitcoin in the title. Um, it's just the what is money show. So it was intended to be, rather than being this uh, assertive kind of approach where like, you know, uh, here's why you need to look at Bitcoin or, you know, like a, like pushing it on someone. It was intended to be more of a pull. It's like, well, you know, let me invite you into this line of inquiry, right? Like what is money? Have you thought about this? Well, let's start looking at all the different aspects of it and the things that it touches and how it influences history and human action. Um, so I intended the show, you know, I, I even early on, I mean, we, if you've listened to the show at all, we are a Bitcoin podcast. Like there's no secret about that, but it was intended to be, um, something that was more subtle than like this in your face kind of Bitcoin podcast. Because I know, like, I, I remember what it was like to be outside of Bitcoin, right? To be a pre Bitcoiner. If I saw a podcast that was like, you know, the Bitcoin podcast or whatever it's called, I wouldn't be drawn to that. That wouldn't, it would feel like someone was trying to sell me something. Again, if you put on your pre-Bitcoiner hat, right, when we all thought it was magic internet money or Ponzi scheme or whatever, whatever derisive perspective you had on it that caused you not to look more deeply into it, um, I felt that those that positioning was less effective for someone like me. So I just tried to create a show that would be appealing to someone like me. And for me, it's like, invite me in, right? Ask the question, tell me, you know, let's look at different angles. Let's try to argue it. Let's think adversarially. Um, that That's just how I try to learn. And um, so I guess that's one approach. And I hope it helps, you know, I hope it's helping. Our numbers are really good and growing. So I don't know, you know, I don't know exactly who listens to the show. I know we've got a lot of Bitcoiners that listen to the show, but I think there's a lot of people becoming Bitcoiners because of the show. Like they come into the, they hear me on whatever thing, they listen to one of the episodes. We say in the pre-roll sequence, like if this is your first time listening to this show, I highly recommend you go back to episode one and start with the Sailor series and just go there. And like, as far as orange pilling on a podcast goes, definitely orange pilling on my podcast, there's no better resource. Like just go to episode one and listen to it straight through. Um, I, you know, I hope that's contributing to bursting the Bitcoin echo chamber to some extent and getting these, these newbies, um, a proper orange filling experience when they discover me or the podcast. Um, another thing that comes to mind is just living the, like really living the philosophy. It's not enough to espouse and articulate and, you know, we all, look, I'm the guiltiest of us all. I love to talk about these topics and I find it very useful. I love talking to smart people about these big, strange ideas and wrestling with them and, you know, getting wrapped up in authentic dialogue. It's, it's great. It's like a sport, you know, it's so much fun and fulfilling in many ways, but it's not enough, right? The words, again, maybe somewhat related to that inadequacy of language I mentioned earlier, the words are not enough. Um, I'm reminded, you know, something, fuck, was it Plato or someone said like, let us suspect any man who, who does not take care of himself, like suspect any philosopher that does not take care of himself, right? Like we have to live what we say. And so with Bitcoin, it's like, you know, truth, proof of work, responsibility, self-sovereignty, freedom, integrity, you know, all of these like themes or these attributes or principles that are encoded in Bitcoin. I think we have to really strive to incorporate those into our own lives and live by that example and not, not like you're trying to put on a show like, Oh, look at me. I'm so into proof of work and truth, like actually do it. Like actually 
call yourself on your own bullshit, you know, figure out a way to integrate your shadow. We all have these, these dark sides. You can't get rid of them. You can only acknowledge them, befriend them and integrate them into yourself, becoming a more whole person in the process. And then just leading by example. Um, I think that's essential. Like if you want to really be a full blooded Bitcoiner, you have got to adhere to this philosophy in an embodied way. All right. It's not enough to talk about it. It's not enough to study it. This is like, uh, what does Musashi say in the book of nine rings? He'll tell you all these things. He's like, but reading about it is not enough. You must practice. He concludes like every passage with that, like one of the one of my favorite phrases of his is the way is in training, the way which is like basically the god of of Eastern philosophy, right? Tao, the way, the path, the true course, the true way, something like that. The way of nature is in training, he says. So it's like you have to actually create these uh, regimens for yourself, these patterns of living this lifestyle and, and adhere to it and adapt and constantly adapt it and reevaluate it. And so that's what I'm trying to do. You know, it's Bitcoin has changed me a lot, but it, it's only increased my aspirations for further change. Like I want to get better and better and better. Um, and you know, I, none of us are perfect and it's not easy and it's a, it's an eternal struggle, but it just seems so important that if we're going to represent this movement adequately to the outside world, that we need to be living, breathing examples of the power of Bitcoin, the truthfulness of Bitcoin, the the freedom of Bitcoin, you know, all of these things. So, um, yeah. yeah. Lead by example, yeah. 100%. Robert, uh, Man, it's truly been an honor uh, to have you for the first time on Simply Bitcoin IRL. Why don't you tell everybody where they can find you on the interwebs and most importantly, um, any events or any things that you know that you have coming up in the near future that you want to talk about that you're interested in. I know that you're speaking at the Bitcoin conference and I know that you're, you will be also speaking at the Thank God for Bitcoin as well. I'll see you there on both of those. Um, should be great. Um, so, uh, yeah. Why don't you yeah, so many events coming up, um, before the Bitcoin conference, I'll be in Orlando for the micro strategy lightning event. Um, that's the, I think the week May 2nd through 5th, something like that. Um, not speaking there. I'll just be participating in the event. Uh, I'll be in Miami. Um, we'll be there a week prior to the conference recording a bunch of episodes We'll be there for a few days after recording a bunch of episodes. I'll be at a lot of the events, the side events, speaking at the conference. I think I'm also doing a fireside chat at the conference. Um, after that, I'll be in Bitcoin Prague. It's another big event in Europe. Speaking there, doing some panels there. I'll be at the Oslo Freedom Forum uh, with the Human Rights Foundation, also interviewing some of their guests there. Um, I'll be at Bitbox Boom. That's in August um of this year i'll be speaking there and yeah you know trying to just get out there and hopefully represent bitcoin uh in the best light possible you know i just i it's so important that more people that we recruit more hearts and minds into this space so i hope all of these meet space events are useful for that um I know I really look like every year I look forward to the Miami conference because it's just a, it's just a love fest, man. Like Bitcoiners are down there just vibing and enjoying each other's company, sharing some stimulating conversation, you know, having some good food, some drinks. It's, it's really a good time. So I am thrilled about that. Uh, for the interwebs where you can find me on the interwebs, what is money podcast.com. And then my Twitter handle is at breed love 22. Awesome, man. Well, looking forward to seeing you in Miami. Um, we'll show, we, I'm sure we will cross paths. And uh, like I said, man, it's really been an honor to have you on the show. Mm -hmm.